1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. And I'm going to pause after the first verse to explain something and, and, and direct your attention a particular way. Okay? So 1 Corinthians 7 1 reads, and I'm going to read in the New International Version now in the 1984 edition that we have here in the seats. It says, Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. Okay? Now, if you look carefully, you'll see at the end of that verse, you'll see this, this little letter. And that points you to a footnote at the bottom of your page. And if you find that footnote, you see it says, or, quote, the quotation mark is important, quote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, end quote. Okay? The reason that, those, that that is there is that there are two different ways to translate and understand this book. And I'm going to, this verse, and I'm going to tell you right now without going into the details, that the, that the footnote version is the right one, okay? The footnote version is the right one. That's what we're going with. That's the, that's the better rendering of it. So what that means is, Paul is writing to them and he's saying, this Apostle Paul is writing to these Christians in the church at Corinth, Greece, and he's saying, now for the matters you wrote about, and I quote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, unquote. In other words, that's what the Corinthians wrote to him, and now that's what he's replying to. Verse 2. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. That is our New Testament reading today. Our Old Testament reading is from a book that you may have never looked at before. It's in the Old Testament and it's called Song of Songs. Now the way to find this book is you open up to the middle of the Bible and you'll probably hit Psalms or Proverbs and then just keep going a few pages to the right and eventually you'll get to this short book called Song of Songs, also known as Song of Solomon. That's because Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 1, says the Song of Songs of Solomon. So in some Bibles it's called Song of Songs, in other Bibles it's called Song of Solomon. And uh, what that means, Song of Songs is a Hebrew way of saying this is the best song ever. That's what Song of Songs means. This is the best song ever. And Song of Solomon, the of Solomon part means that either Solomon wrote it, this king who is the son of David, or it means that there was a poet in his court who wrote it and dedicated it to Solomon. We don't really know. And we're going to go to Song of Songs, and we're going to go to the last part of this in chapter 8. Now, another thing about this song is this song was written for three groups of people. It was written for a female soloist, and a male soloist and a group. And so in some Bibles, it will call the female soloist uh, the bride and the male soloist the groom and the, the rest of the group the chorus. In the New International Version, it calls the, the, the female soloist, the woman, the beloved. And in, uh, it calls the male soloist, the man, the lover, and then it calls the group of people who sing the friends, okay? So if you're looking at the New International Version, friends means the group, beloved means the woman, lover means the man, okay? As they're singing back and forth in this song. And so we're looking at Song of Songs, chapter 8, beginning at verse 5, okay? Chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. Who is this coming up from the desert, leaning on her lover? Under the apple tree I roused you. There your mother conceived you. There she who was in labor gave you birth. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. 
If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. We have a young sister, and her breasts are not yet grown. What shall we do for our sister for the day she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build towers of silver on her. If she is a door, we will enclose her with panels of cedar. I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. Thus I have become in his eyes like one bringing contentment. Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Hamon. He let out his vineyard to tenants. Each was to bring for its fruit a thousand shekels of silver. But my own vineyard is mine to give. The thousand shekels are for you, O Solomon, and two hundred are for those who tend its fruit. You who dwell in the gardens with friends in attendance, let me hear your voice. Come away, my lover, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the spice-laden mountains. Now, is that the craziest thing you've ever read in the Bible or what? All right, so we're going we're gonna to get into this crazy thing because you guys have just hit the jackpot today that you decided to show up to church today. I mean, other people, they decide not to show up to church and they're missing out, okay? Because you are about to hear a sermon like you've never heard before and like I've never delivered before. As you know, if you've been with us at some point within these last few weeks, I've said that we're in this series We are looking at what God says and what the Bible says about sex and marriage. The first two weeks of that, we didn't talk about either one, hardly at all. We just talked about the Bible. We talked about the Bible for two weeks, okay? And then last week, we talked about marriage. So you can guess what this week is about. So this week, we are going to begin and we are going to talk about sex, about sexuality, And we're going to talk about it in other ways in the coming weeks, but this is the first week that we banish the kids from the room to talk about this. And and today we're going to talk about the goodness of sex as God has created it. Now, I admit it, I am a little bit embarrassed preaching this message. And I'm a little bit embarrassed because this is not the sort of thing that I would want to talk about with my grandparents And I have some senior saints in the room right now who are like grandparents to me. So we're all a little bit uncomfortable here. But I'm preaching it anyway because of several reasons. Number one, I had a youth pastor when I was a kid who did great things to tell me what the Bible said about this thing that was important to me that that I wouldn't hear from any other way. And we've got some young people here. We've got some teenagers here today. I know my son is, is listening uh, over the internet today. He's sick at home. And I want you guys, okay? So Ashley, Vinny, I don't know if Devin's here, all right? Um, you know, I, I want you guys to hear this because you're not going to hear this anywhere else. I promise you, okay? Um, but also for these other reasons, God talks about it in the Bible. So if God talks about it in the Bible, we had better talk about it, Okay. It's, it's a critical part of all of our lives as sexual beings, even if we are not currently sexually active. If we are male or female, which we are, then this has affected us. This is a part of our nature. A th- another reason is that you know and I know that the world that we float in is soaked in this, is talking about it, blaring it out all the time. And where do you expect to get the truth about this? Do you expect to get it from TV? Do you expect to get it from the magazines on the racks at the grocery store? I don't think so. We we expect to get the truth in the Word of God to understand and to confront the untruths in our world. And finally, we're talking about it because there is nothing, zero, in human life with as much creative power and as much destructive power as sex. There is nothing in human life with as much creative power and destructive power as sex. Sex has the power to give life. You are here today because of this, okay? The power to give life and even to reproduce the very image of God on this earth. I mentioned this uh, last week, I believe, in Genesis chapter 5, 1 through 3. We read that when God created humankind, He made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. And when they were created, he blessed them and named them humankind. 
When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness according to his image, and he named him Seth. See, God created Adam and Eve in his image to display himself in this world. And when they had a child, that image was increased and completed and multiplied and spread along as God himself told human beings to do, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth so that my picture would be all over the world. Sex has the power to create life and extend the image of God, but it also has the power to destroy the very substance of the person engaged in it. As Paul writes one chapter before what we read in 1 Corinthians 6, he writes, flee from sexual immorality. Bad things. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. That, that There are lots of ways that we can mess up. There's lots of ways that we can do wrong. What God tells us. There's lots of ways that we can break his rules. But these are peculiar in that they have a peculiar power. This thing has a, is so powerful that, that breaking God's warning, you know, touching the live wire, has the power to destroy us in a deep way. In a way that we wouldn't otherwise experience. And we see this with disease around the world. I mean, think about all the people with HIV in Africa and in India. Think about all the orphans in those places who have suffered because of this, right? Not to mention what it does to our souls and to our minds, which we'll talk about in later weeks. Not going to get into that today. But it's so very, very important. So here's how this sermon is going to benefit you even if you are not or should not be in a sexually active situation. You either are going to be in the future, and this is going to give you a realistic perspective on it, or you will not be in the future, and this will equip you to help the people in your life who are or who will be. Okay, So this is good for all of us. Now, i, I gotta, I, I got to tell you right up front, I'm not going to cover, and this is not going to be as uncomfortable as the same territory as the instructional film that you may have seen in fifth grade, you know, where you're like, oh my gosh, why are we in the, what, what is going on? I didn't sign up for this, you know. We're, we're not going to get in any of that territory. However, I do want to let you know, this is very important. If your only memorable sex education came from that one kid in grade school who seemed to know things before anybody else did, that was how my father got his sex education. He's, he's willing to tell you the story, okay? But, but if, if, that's, if that's the only place you got it, or from the nonsense on TV and movies, or even, sad to say, from sexual trauma that you have experienced, it is not too late to get started. No matter how old you are, not too late to get started to know the truth. I want to I give you a resource. I'm doing this throughout this series this is a resource, a website called www.passionatecommitment.com. Okay? These two people here are Clifford Penner and Joy Penner. And these are Christians. These are Bible-believing, solid Christian people. And they're also sex therapists. They, they wrote a book uh, called How to Get Your Sex Life Off to a Great Start. Kelly and I read it before we were married. It was very helpful to us. Their, um, their, their major book is called The Gift of Sex, and they've also written a book called Restoring the Pleasure to help couples who are experiencing difficulty in their sex life to get back on track. And if you go to this website, there are these frequently asked questions that is what, pretty much whatever's on your mind that's very, very helpful. You can get their resources, and it's a great place to start. You know, don't have questions and not get answers. Get them from the right sources, okay? So I really encourage you to go in this direction, to go with these folks. They're, they're very reliable. So the main thing to say, the thing that God wants us to know about sexuality is that sex is for pleasure and for procreation. Sex is for pleasure and for procreation. And this is important to know as a foundational statement because many times in the history of the world, it's been just about procreation in different places and times. At least officially, it's been just about procreation, even though there's some people breaking the rules to make it about pleasure, you know. But um, I love that my wife laughs. She's so great. That's why I married her. She's the best. Anyway, but also because we live in a world now we're in our wider culture. It's just about pleasure. It's not about procreation at all. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But what the Bible says is that it's about both. Sex is about pleasure and it's for procreation. Now let me, let me ask you a question. Have you guys ever heard the term Puritan? 
You ever heard the term Puritan? I mean, maybe you get your dry cleaning done at the Puritan cleaners. Maybe that's where you're familiar with the term, okay? The Puritans. The Puritans were these guys and, and women, men and women, who lived in England in the 1600s, and they came to America, and they founded uh, colonies in New England, especially Massachusetts, and also on Long Island, and also in part of northern New Jersey. Newark, New Jersey was originally New Ark of the Covenant. Did you know that? Isn't that crazy? They, so these people founded this. And the Puritans, you may have heard the adjective taken from the word Puritan, puritanical. You ever heard that word before? Puritanical? Puritanical is a word that people used, especially having to do with sex, to say that, the, that puritanical means prudes who hate pleasure and don't want anybody to have any fun, and they think they're better than everybody else. Now, there is a statue called the Puritan in Springfield, Massachusetts. It looks like this. Now, this dude is pretty impressive. And this statue was made in the late 1800s. And if you look at this dude, you would think that this guy might be pretty puritanical. You know, you, you do not want this guy to be teaching your sexual education class, okay? Th this guy looks pretty... I mean, look at the size of that Bible this man is carrying. Holy moly. I mean, he could bludgeon you to death with that thing. And he probably has, you know? But the thing is... This is a, a, a perspective on Puritans way after they actually lived. And the actual Puritans were anything but puritanical. They were anything but puritanical. They weren't puritanical at all. Because, see, those folks, okay, loved being in love. And they loved sex. And they were very open about this. You're not going to believe this, but it's true. Because, see, these were people who were trying to get back to what the Bible says. And they had come out of this whole period of time where there were elements of Greek philosophy that very much looked down on whatever you did with the body, including sexuality. And that had gotten sucked into Christian teaching through the Middle Ages such that you had sort of a, a two-level um, spirituality. You had the, the basic people who had to do this in order to propagate the species. You know, basic Christians. These are like junior varsity Christians. Then you had the varsity Christians who were the priests and the monks, and they took a vow of celibacy, and they were bigger than all that. They were better than that. They were able to just push those desires aside and be completely pure and spiritual. And that's the Puritan's world. And they looked at the Bible and they said, that's not there at all. That's not what the Bible says. And so they really brought it back. And so much so that in New England, in Massachusetts, if you were in a church, this, we actually have records of this, of situations where there's a couple in a church where the wife, they're members of the church, the wife goes to the, the elders of the church and says, we have a church discipline issue on our hand. My husband is sinning because he's unwilling to have sex with me. And this actually comes before the church, and the church votes and says to the man, you better have sex with your wife or we're going to kick you out of the church. These people in Massachusetts actually did this. These Puritans, they really did. They really did. And you know, one of the earliest American poets was a woman named Anne Bradstreet. Have you ever heard of Anne Bradstreet? Anne Bradstreet wrote some of the most beautiful romantic poetry. These wonderful love poems that she wrote to her husband. That is a part of American literature today. She was a Puritan, and they got this idea because they read the Bible. See, they knew the five whys that we've been talking about. We've talked about three of them so far, and I want to review those with you for the truth about sex and marriage. The, the reason that we say what we say about these things is because, number one, God loves you enough to speak through the Bible, and we can understand it. Number two, God invented sex and marriage for our good and for his. And number three, Sex and marriage are for adults and for their children. So everything I'm telling you today is because of these things that the Puritans knew. They read the Bible and they saw what it says and they applied it to their lives and that's what brings us to this crazy book called Song of Songs. What these ancient Israelites said was the best top number one song. The best song such to, that they decided later on that this was inspired by God himself who wanted it to be in the Bible is this incredibly graphic, erotic love song. You only got a little glimpse of it in what we read. You got to go home and read the whole thing. 
I mean, the whole thing, we've got parts of this thing where the man and the woman are like describing each other's bodies and stuff. I mean, it is like wild. I actually just learned in my research for this, there's a particular verse in this book that English translations don't even fully translate because it's so graphic. I mean, this is the truth. And so you're thinking, God, what were you thinking? And in fact, you know, the, the uh, ancient Jews and Christians, they also wondered what God was thinking. Jewish rabbis thought, well, maybe the reason this is in here is because it's not even really about men and women. It's, it's just a, a, an illustration about how much God loves Israel because there's lots of places in the prophets that talks about God being like a husband and Israel being like his wife. And Christians picked this up and said, well, God couldn't have possibly meant this to have to do with you know, men and women. You know, he, he must have had to do with the relationship between Christ and the church because as we saw last week and we'll see in the future that the Bible describes Christ is like the husband and his church is like the wife. And those things are true. But it's also about, well, what it is. It's weird. And it was weird within its own culture. This book is written in a culture with a traditional model of marriage, but it exalts the desires of the woman and the man as individuals in their own right. That their relationship with one another is good, not, necessarily, not just because of the children they're produced or the families that they're a part of, but because of their own love. That's a, that's a common thing for us as modern people, but it was crazy back then. And not only that, but the woman's voice is dominant. The woman speaks more than the man in this song and about her desires for him. It's remarkable. So what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this song? Not having read the whole thing, you haven't read the whole thing yet, I know you're going to go home and do this, but, but, but let me tell you, let me try to sum it up. What do we learn about this? A few things. Number one, we learn that sexual desire and enjoyment is good for women and men. It's good, because God invented it. You know, it's not like God created human beings and then they started fooling around and God said, whoa, what was I thinking? I did not intend for that to happen. You know, are you kidding me? We're talking about the creator of the universe here. He knows what he's doing. He made this to be good. He put this in the Bible to tell you that sexuality as he designed it and intended it is good and he wants you to get all the good that you can out of it. God wants you to have great sex. I'll just come right out and say it. He wants that. He wants that. That's what we learned from this. It's good. The second thing that we learn from it is that sexual desire is intended to drive us to commitment. Sexual desire is intended to drive us to commitment. Look at verses 6 and 7 here of Song of, of, Song of Songs 8. Th- this is the, the, the wisdom moment of the book. Okay? This is where it comes home as far as the teaching lesson. She, the woman says to her man, place me like a seal over your heart like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. See, that kind of passion drives us to say, make me yours permanently, a hundred percent. Romantic love, falling in love, and sexual desire has a way of making us say crazy things. Can anybody relate to this? Has anybody here said a crazy thing because you were in love before? I have, okay? I mean, this is what you do. It's designed to make you say crazy things like, I will always be yours forever, and I will love you as much as possible. You know, and, and like all of this stuff, it makes you want to do that. Why? Why does sexual desire drive you to commitment? Because commitment nurtures sex. See, sex between two people is highly fragile. And anybody who's been at this for a while knows this. It's affected by all kinds of circumstances. It's affected by our past and by our present. It's affected by our hopes and by our fears. It's affected by our emotional nature and our intellectual nature. It's affected by what we see and what we've had modeled, but it's also affected by very humble physical things like, oh, I think I ate too much. No, not tonight, honey. You know, I mean, just very humble, ordinary things of life. It's very fragile, and it can break down very easily. And it can break down very easily within a relationship. It's a very sensitive, very, very sensitive barometer about the health of a relationship between husband and wife. It's very easily knocked off its axis. It's very easily tipped over. For as as powerful it is as a flame, it also dies out just as easily. 
You know, flame is extremely hot and extremely powerful, but it's not very sturdy, is it? And sex is like that. So sex drives us to commitment because we need that commitment in order to nurture sex, in order for it to work, in order for it to grow, in order for it to develop. When my youth pastor, I told you about Pastor Ron, was in his 50s when he was the leader of my youth group when I was a teenager. And something that Pastor Ron used to tell us, he was very frank about these things, and what he used to tell us was, guys, the older you get and the longer you're married, sex just keeps getting better and better. And I used to think, Pastor Ron, I trust you more than anybody else in the world, but I'm really having a hard time seeing this. I mean, I know you, and I know Mrs. Short, and I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm just having a hard time buying it, but it's true. And the reason is is that the commitment that goes into going long, long, long through time in a marriage, through years and years, is the very thing that makes it good. It's the very thing that makes it work. And that leads us to the third thing that we learn, and that is that sex imprints desire for your beloved on your soul. And now we actually have the, the technology and the medical research to be able to prove this. Like it's actually, we're able to know now enough about the brain. We don't know much about the brain, but we know enough to know that when people are engaged sexually, it causes chemicals to, hap- to, to fire in the brain, and it causes pathways to get etched in the very plastic nature of what the brain is to imprint that person that you are engaged with on yourself, on your brain, in a powerful, powerful way. So much so... That what happens then, moving down to the future, is that if you fall in love with somebody, and that person falls in love with you, and you end up making a commitment to each other, and you ratify that commitment, you, you, you um, ground that commitment in sexual intimacy with one another, it actually etches your brain in such a way to, to alter your expectations of what you want. It changes you so that the thing you want is what you have. So like, for example, when Kelly and I first met, um, she was, I, I was not particularly attracted to Kelly. I wasn't unattracted to her. I didn't think she was unattractive. But it wasn't like there was a spark. It wasn't like there was chemistry or anything like this. And it was the same with, for her towards me. But then later on, after, after a, a long time of knowing each other, and then when those emotions did start to come along, those desires did come along, and then, and then after being together for some time, and then eventually sealing that in marriage, and, and engaging in a sexual relationship with one another, now, my type is Kelly. She is my type. That's it. You know? So, so my brain, my soul was changed and altered through this. Okay? And, and, so, and so what happens is this is supposed to happen. Now, like all cultures, ancient Israelites had figures of speech for this activity, ways to talk about it without being blunt. For example, in our culture, we use the term sleep with, and as Jerry Seinfeld pointed pointed out it doesn't really have anything to do with sleep you know um in an episode of seinfeld you might remember it the ancient israelites had a similar one lie with you may have seen that in the bible he lay with his you know wife and and they had a child this sort of thing we saw that with adam and eve but another major one that you see in the bible is to know someone that's another way that the ancient israelites talked he knew his wife or she knew him and what a what an interesting and perfect way of describing it Because there is a knowledge there that God intended. We saw last week in Genesis 2 about how God created human beings to leave their fathers and mothers, a man and woman, and for the two to become one flesh. To become one in a whole person covenant. A whole nature where I share all of me with you and you share all of you with me in all aspects of my life and of my being. And we know each other. Listen to me, folks. It's not just because of the shape of our bodies, but because of the shape of our souls that human beings are the only animal to mate facing each other. It's not just because of how our bodies are shaped, but how our souls are shaped, that we're supposed to be looking in each other's eyes when we're doing this. There's nothing else on earth that you can find that's doing that. And the fourth thing to point out that's so important is that sex is meant to be reserved for the right time. And this is obvious from the previous three, isn't it? I mean, if sex is intended to drive us to commitment and to imprint somebody on our soul, of course it's supposed to be reserved for the right time and for the right person that's going to be yours. Look at again at Song song 8. 
in, um, in verse, verses 8 and 9. We have these other bystanders here who are talking about somebody in their family. We have a young sister and her breasts are not yet grown, so she hasn't hit puberty yet. What shall we do for our sister for the day she is spoken for? And they use this interesting metaphor. If she's a wall, we'll build towers of silver on her. If she's a door, we will enclose her with panels of cedar. It's a, it's a poetic way of saying we're going to make her beautiful, but we're also going to protect her. We are going to shut her up. We're going to stop her until the right time, until she's ready. And if you look elsewhere in the song, there's three places where the woman says the following. She says, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. And it's obvious from what we saw last week, and if you didn't catch it last week, I hope you go on YouTube or go onto our church's website, which will link you to YouTube, and watch it. Because we talked about how marriage is a whole person covenant that unites a man and a woman. And it's obvious that that is the thing that we're waiting for. It is obvious that that is the right time. And we'll talk more about that in later weeks. But it's obvious that that fits the bill for all of this. The thing that you need to know is that the movies lie. The movies lie. They lie. The TV lies about sexuality. It lies about great sex. And anybody... Everybody who's ever had any experience knows this. I mean, there's all kinds of odd physical details about the activity that never appear in the movies. And in the movies, the people who are having this amazing sex are all young, which proves it's fake because young people aren't capable of having great sex because you don't really know what you're doing. And the movie characters tend to be promiscuous, which definitely means that they're not having great sex. You know why? Because it's not about performance. It's about relationship and it's about commitment, and it's about covenant, and it's about love, and you don't get that by being James Bond. That does not happen that way. The thrill of great sex is not the thrill of sneaking around. It's not the thrill of breaking the rules, or seducing, or conquering, or worst of all, of being conquered by somebody else. Yes, I'm talking about Fifty Shades of Grey. If that's the only kind of thrill you know in sex, then you've never had thrilling sex. You've had thrilling sin. If that's the only kind of thrill you know in sex, you've never had thrilling sex. You've had thrilling sin. Thrilling sin is thrilling in the short term, but it crushes you in the long term. It takes more than it gives. And it takes more than it gives in two ways. You are taking from someone else. And also, it is taking from you. And leaving less of you than was there before. And not only that, but thrilling sex takes a lot. I mean, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of work. But it gives so much more. Because you're giving to somebody else. And it's giving to you. So if you're not married and you're not having sex, I want this to encourage you to stay on that path, even if you happen to be on it by accident. I want you to stay on that path on purpose. And if you're not married and you are having sex, then I want to encourage you to do something new. To give it up on purpose. And I'm going to give you more reasons for this and more resources for this in the weeks to come. But what if you are married? What do you do with this if you are married? Well, that's where we get guidance from the Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians. And Paul says these remarkable things in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul himself, who's not married, and we're going to learn all about that in the future, but in another message. But in 1 Corinthians 7, he basically says, you guys need to be doing this. You, you husbands and wives need to be doing this. You need to be engaged in this because both husband and wife need it. Look at these remarkable words in, in verse, verses 2 and 3. Each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone but to his wife. He's saying this in a culture that's assuming that the men are in charge and the women are not. That's assuming that the way a marriage works is that the man gets what he wants and he orders things and this is how it's going to be. He also lives in a culture that assumes that marriage is what you have in order to produce children, but then if you really want to have fun, then the wife is not allowed to have fun and the husband goes out and sees a prostitute or has a mistress to have fun. This is the world that these Corinthians were living in and Paul's trying to tell them, you got to stop. You gotta, that's sin. That's bad. What God intends for you is for you both to be enjoying this together. To be together in doing this. There are these wonderful Proverbs in the book of Proverbs about this. 
And he's saying that you need this. Why do you need it? In verse 5, he says, he says, look, don't deprive each other. Don't just say we're not going to do this except by mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. So kind of like fasting. Sometimes when we, when we pray, we fast. We don't eat. And we focus on prayer. And this is similar to fasting, but of course, eventually we do eat again. And he says, so make these times temporary, not permanent. Why? So that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, some of this self-control is obvious, right? He's saying, God has given you to one another so you can satisfy your needs and desires so that you're not tempted to get those in some place that God says is wrong and is against his law and is destructive to you. But anybody who's been married knows that there's more than one way to have a lack of self-control because there's also self-control with our attitudes and there's self-control with our selfishness and there's self-control with our resentment and there's self-control with our anger And they're self-controlled at being just royally ticked off with this person that we happen to be cohabiting with. In our home, this person we're married to, this stranger who's now driving us crazy. Right? I mean, and so we we can have an easy lack of self-control with our spouses, can we not? I mean, am I the only one here who's ever like said things to my spouse that I wouldn't say to a stranger? Right? Am I the only person here who's ever said things to my spouse that are mean, that are cutting, that are hurtful? that are wrong, that are angry, that are selfish, that are rude? Am I the only one? No, a couple of other people have also said such things. Okay? Right? So we have all kinds of things that we need to control ourselves with. Right? And, and Tim Keller, who I talked about last week, showed you a picture of him and his wife in his book, The Meaning of Marriage. Go out, buy it, read it, learn it, live it, love it. It's great. Tim Keller talks about sexuality as what God has created in marriage as a covenant renewal ceremony. The ancient Israelites, when, they would, um, when God made a covenant with them, a covenant to be their God and for them to be God's people, they would periodically have a renewal where they would come back and they would, they would promise again of the kind of people they were going to be to God. And they would say, yes, we're going to obey you. We're going to love you with all that we are. And Keller argues that sex within marriage is a covenant renewal ceremony. It's our thing that we do every so often to say, yes. I love you. Yes, I'm giving my whole self to you. Yes, I'm accepting you as you are. Not just as I want you, but as you actually are right now. Not just as you were, not just as you might be, but as you are. And I'm embracing you, and it gets us again to say those crazy things that we ought to be saying now once we're married, like, I love you forever. When you've made that commitment, you'd better be saying that. You'd better be believing it. And sex within marriage can be a sort of reset button. It's a sort of thing where you say, oh yeah, that's right, I do love you. I I kind of forgot that for a few days, you know. And it's important that way. We need to do that in order to water that tree of our marriage to make it grow and to make it strong. And so obviously the implication of this is several things. It means that sex is not primarily about getting pleasure, it's about giving it. It's about giving it to somebody else. It's about loving somebody else and making someone happy. And you know that you've really hit it. You know that you're really in the sweet spot when the thing that's really, when you get to a point where you say, okay, I'm willing to receive from you, not mainly because I want to receive, but because I know that you get so much joy out of giving that I want to give you the joy of giving to me. I mean, when everybody's trying to outgive the other, then you know you've hit it. That's what love is, isn't it? Isn't that what we want in our marriages? Isn't that what God did for us? to give to us so that we would give back to him so that he'd keep giving to us? That's the whole pattern. That's why marriage is like how Christ is with the church. That's the cycle of love. And this is a part of that. And it shouldn't be surprising because in our marriages, each spouse has a mixture of need for the other and giving to the other. And as long as it's mainly about need, the marriage will die and the sex will be lousy. Thrilling at first but then it goes down. And we start to think the problem with the, is with the other person, but the problem is with our own refusal to give and to love. So what's a next step for you if you're married? What one step, however small, can you take this week toward giving love to your spouse in this way? Well, there's different options. I mean, one thing is a predetermined decision to say yes. To say, I'm going to say yes to my spouse when I'm approached by my spouse, whether or not I'm in the mood. It's not about being in the mood. 
It's about loving. I'm not always in the mood to love. But I'm going to love whether I'm in the mood or not. Thank God that Jesus was willing to love me even when he was not in the mood. When he was hanging on the cross, he was not in the mood. But he loved me anyway, and that's how I'm going to love my spouse. Another way is to set a schedule. You know, I mean, if you're like Kelly and me and crazy busy and you got kids going around, you got these different places you go, you got to just say, you know what? Forget mood. Like, this is happening on this date. Put it on the calendar. You know, be practical about this. We got to renew the covenant. Another thing you can do is get one of the Penner's books, you know, and get one of the Penner's books and, and read that and get some insight, especially that one, Restoring the Pleasure. I believe they have exercises in there that can help if, if, there, if things have been dormant between you and your spouse for a long time to incrementally, just, just a little bit at a time, begin to rekindle the passion in a step-by-step slow way that's not threatening. That can help. And if the thought of taking that step with your spouse, even thinking about it now, gets you highly anxious or upset, then this might reveal something in you that God wants to heal. Maybe a trauma that you've suffered. Maybe an addiction to sex or lust outside of marriage that you need to be delivered from. Maybe, and most likely, unforgiveness and a grudge and a resentment that you hold against your spouse that you need to let go. And if that's the case for you, please get help. Please use this as an opportunity to get help. Get one of these books. Talk to me. Talk to a counselor. Talk to me and say, I don't want to talk to you, Pastor, but I do want to know a, a counselor that I can talk to. And I'll, and I'll refer you to somebody. No questions asked. But take a step. Take a step. Don't just leave things the way they are in your, love, in your, in your marriage and in your sex life. Now, because sex is about giving, it shouldn't be surprising that sex is about giving life to new human beings, children. Now listen, I know that this is an extraordinarily sensitive area for couples who struggle to have children, for whatever reason. And I want you to know, I do not bring this up today to open a wound for you. I don't. I bring it up because there are so many people in the culture who don't know what you already know. You already know that children are good. You already know that God brought men and women together to have children. But there's a lot of people who don't know that. Now the fact that we even have to state that sex has to do with producing children is itself pretty astonishing when you think about it, right? I mean, that's like pretty obvious. But what the invention of contraception has done to our minds is far more profound than what it's done to our bodies. What it has done in our thinking and in our living and in our way we exist as a society is to break the connection between sex and procreation such that they're considered two separate categories in how people live their lives. And on the other side, with artificial conception methods, so that now the two really have nothing to do with one another. Now, you've probably heard that Roman Catholics, take, at least as a church, take a strong opinion against contraception of any sort, unless it's of a natural sort of making a decision about when we're going to do this so as to align with when we are or are not fertile. Um, Protestants tend to take a different point of view. We disagree about contraception that prevents conception. But we do agree, by and large, about any pill or surgery that destroys a new human being after conception. And I'm referring to abortion. Now I know this is extremely sensitive and I hesitate to say anything on this subject since I don't have time to say everything on the subject. But it's difficult for me not to preach on this with at least mentioning just one thing. One thing. And that is that from a Christian point of view, when there is as little as one human cell that has a complete set of DNA that is different from the mother's, that is a new human being. A new body. A new person. And to quote Dr. Seuss's Horton the Elephant, a person's a person no matter how small. Now, if you've had an abortion, I believe from Scripture, even though it's not clearly spelled out, that that child lives today and is safe and is happy and loves you and loves you very much and is so thankful for you. And if you are one with Christ by faith, you will see that child someday. 
and you will embrace someday and you'll have eternity to spend with one another. What I do know from Scripture for sure is that because of what Jesus Christ did for us to die on the cross, God forgives you of anything and everything you've ever done if you look to him for salvation through Jesus Christ's blood. And that, my friends, leads us to the very most important thing. Falling in love is amazing. It's an amazing experience. Let me tell you something. If I could go back to a weekend with Kelly in Door County, Wisconsin, in the summer of 1997, and if I could feel what I felt then, and if I could see in her eyes what I saw in her eyes then, I would do it in a heartbeat. I would do it in a second if I could go back and if I could experience that first love again. But only if after a few hours I could come back to the present. Importantly, I haven't always felt this way. There have been times that I've wanted to go back to Door County, Wisconsin in 1997 and not come back because the present was hard, because it was tough, because it wasn't fun, because it didn't have the thrill, because it didn't have the passion, because it was so much stinking work. It was not just automatic. But thank God I've learned that now... What we have is so precious and is so good and is so powerful that I would never want to surrender that. I would never want to give that up. I would never want to lose that to go back to have those hot passions that didn't have the substance that we have today. The substance that does yield passion from time to time but yields so much more. And the reason for this is that the apocalyptic romance, as some have called it, cannot save you. That romance you've seen in the movies where the person is messed up and they're they're all tortured and sad and depressed and anxious and everything is out of whack in their life and then when they just find that one person and everything comes together and everything is great, it's not real. It's a lie. It's not real. Those stories end just as it's really beginning. The apocalyptic romance cannot save you. The person that you want to fall in love with to complete you, your soulmate, cannot save you. Jesus Christ alone can save you. He alone can give you real life, abundant life, eternal life that the greatest love affair ever could not possibly provide. Because the real greatest love affair ever is the one between Christ and and his church, between the Son of God and his bride. And there is a wedding that we are going to someday that you are invited to if you put your faith in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as your Savior, as your Lord, as your name, as your identity. And so to that end, I want to pray right now. And if this is the first time that you've ever done that, you've ever committed to the Lord that way, I want you to pray along with me. Pray along with me. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm so hungry and thirsty. I have such intense passions and desires. I have longings in my soul. But I now believe that those longings can only be fulfilled by You. Only You can fill what's lacking in my life. Only You can truly complete me. Only You can give me eternal life. Please forgive me for chasing everything else. I'm leaving it behind. I'm trusting You. I'm going to follow You the rest of my life. Forgive my sins and change my heart. Amen. I want you to take the bulletins that you got when you came in, uh, or if you didn't get one, they're there in front of you, and take a card, a card like this that's in front of you, or that you had in your bulletins, and tear that in half. And on the side that has the church's name, I want you to flip that over, and there's some options of what you might want to do with this message, including a blank, where you can fill in whatever you want to fill in.
place a check box there and uh, keep that as a commitment to the Lord that is a reminder to yourself and take that home with you. Take the other side, please, and put your name and any contact information we don't have for you. That way we can keep in touch. And then on the other side, please let me know. Whatever decision you've made today or anything else you'd like to communicate with me, you can hand that to me or you can put it in your seat before you leave and it'll be collected discreetly. While you're doing that and while you're spending this time with the Lord, Kelly's going to play and you can sing along before we conclude. Mm -hmm.